Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Welcome back to those who've already been following the first of today's webinars. Welcome to those who are just joining us today for the fourth in a series of webinars brought to you by the Council of Europe entitled Data Protection Views from Strasbourg. We have a very strong and truly international lineup of experts today. There will also be a Q&A session after the presentations of the experts. So please send in your questions via the BlueJeans Q&A tool. I can ask the questions on your behalf, or if you prefer, you can put your questions directly to our panel of experts. Pat Walsh is with us. Pat, you can start the conversation today on issues related to digital identity. Pat, you have 10 minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so, digital identity, I mean, I, I did a lot of research recently on this subject. And I guess the question for me, you know, the session is about our digital identity programs being implemented with privacy by design. Uh, a big question for me is that there are so many multiple definitions on digital identity that what I see is beyond <clears throat> digital identifiers that we use in our everyday lives, whether that's an email address we've created to access um, Facebook or Netflix, etc. What I'm seeing increasingly are agendas and initiatives <clears throat> in different countries, different regions of the world that are driving the, what I would say, the, digitized, the digitization of a legal identity as a national and foundational identity being represented as digital ID. So what I mean by that is <clears throat> many of us might be on a, a, a functional identity system such as a birth registration, but under, for example, the UN Sustainability Goals and Goal 16.9, we see this effort, this drive to provide legal identities uh, that's considered necessary for people to access basic services uh, around the world to be able to distribute social protection, for example. But what I see now is an effort to transform, um, if you like, that civil registration, birth registration processes into a bedrock of a national digital ID. And what I see is the digitization of that into a, a unique, a universal and unique national identity, identity system and identifier. And I've also seen, um, what I would say is the commodification, the commercial advocacy and commodification of digital identity as a fundamental human right. We see that by some of the digital identity players who are selling digital identity solutions, et cetera. Um, and I think before you can even ask the question about privacy by design, you've got to ask, well, what is the scope and the objective, beginning with the policy level? So for me, identity by whom, for whom, and on whose terms? Um, if we look, for example, the World Bank has data that says that 168 countries in the world have established national identity schemes. Approximately 159 are classed as digitized ID systems, and approximately 103 collect biometrics. And then we have things like, for example, in many countries of the world, 155 to be precise, we have mandatory SIM registration. So in order to obtain a mobile phone, you need to be able to provide your passport, driver's license, or increasingly your national ID. 12 of those 155 countries, those SIM registration schemes are biometric in nature. And then let's think back <coughs> to those figures. Uh, Graham Greenleaf does wonderful work in um, publishing details of those countries that have data protection laws. We have 142 data protection laws in the world. And not all of those laws deal with this subject. Not all of them incorporate requirements for data protection by design or by default, for example. Uh, not all of them have a definition expressly or expressly deal with biometric data, for example. So again, that raises questions of when you talk about privacy by design, where is the uh, legal uh, framework to support that approach and to ensure that these things are done. And then if we think of privacy by design or human rights by design, I'm, I kind of think of court cases in Kenya on the Hidumanamba uh, identity system and then Jamaica on their national identity system, where the courts struck down entirely or in significant parts um, those schemes on the basis that um, uh, 
of, of the impact that digitalized systems have on human rights, including discrimination and marginalization, and we see that. And often, I think, when you just talk about privacy by design, it kind of narrows the focus and it narrows thinking uh, away from, well, how does this discriminate? How does this marginalize uh, people? And what these courts also did is come back again to and uh, um, reiterated the importance of ensuring that the state's interference with the exercise of right to freedom is proportionate uh, to the goal that it seeks. Um, and it should impair as little as possible uh, rights and freedoms. And you should consider the severity of any deleterious effects on, on individuals and on groups. Um, and the courts reiterated that it was absolutely vital to ensure an appropriate legal and regulatory framework, in their words, in which sufficient safeguards are built in to protect fundamental human rights. And, and that comes back again to when we talk about privacy by design or human rights by design, that we need to begin thinking of that at the policy level um, and ensure then that we also have the appropriate legal and regulatory frameworks in place. And that requires capacity building also because not only are some of these things missing in law, uh, they're missing in the regulatory space for those who are meant to uphold um, rights and freedoms. And if I think back to a 2011 resolution, 1797 of the Council of Europe on biometrics, um, it emphasized, for example, in that resolution, the need to assess the potential risks resulting from the use of biometrics um, for human rights and for fundamental freedoms and share the results between member states. It also called for standardized definitions of biometrics. So there are resolutions that we have that I think we need to pick upon also. And so for me, well, I've got a few minutes left, Nigel, I think, haven't I? Um, and then, so for me, it comes back to, you know, to what degree are associated human rights considered at the policy, the legal, the design, the implementation, and the management of digitalized systems? in order to avoid narrow conceptions of, of, of privacy. Um, when I look at some research, uh, particularly by NGOs, that looked at the lived experiences, for example, of refugees and the impact that, that digital identity systems had on them, where those digital identity systems being run, for example, by the UN uh, HCR, on, um, that were linked then to national identity systems, where that also excluded, where that also marginalized groups. Um, I think that calls again for uh, a need to ensure appropriate uh, stakeholder engagement and to gauge the views of, well, how do these communities perceive risk? How do they perceive harms? Because at the moment, all the discussion of privacy by design is all more uh, me from a, a, a Western perspective of what we mean by privacy, what we mean by design. And yet so little is asked of these communities uh, of these groups about the impact that such systems have on them. And that's where it was good to see, for example, in Kenya and the Hidoma Namba case, uh, that challenge and legal precedence being set. And of course, in the Ada case, um, I think that's about it for me. I just wanted to set out at a, at a high level, Nigel, those things, uh, really. Um, I guess, and, and it brings me neatly to, I guess, Convention 108 Plus, which provides, um, for me, some of those court rulings from Hadam and Amber and from um, um, the Jamaican case come back to and reinforce the importance of key provisions of 108 Plus, which is Article 1, objective and purpose. Uh, the process of personal data should respect individuals' human rights, fundamental freedoms, and in particular, the right to privacy. So again, the emphasis is on fundamental rights and freedoms and how does the use of data impact on those. And then Article 11, restrictions and exceptions, uh, you know, measures interfering with rights and freedoms must be provided by law and order to the extent that it constitutes a necessary and proportionate measure in a democratic society. We've seen in a number of these national identity systems where that isn't, where, where that isn't met, that test is not met at all. And then Article 10, additional obligations, data processing should be designed in such a manner to prevent or minimize the risk of interference with the rights and fundamental freedoms of individuals. So again, I think those three key aspects of Convention 108 um, provide a basis on which to begin, even at the policy level, at um, the importance and how you design for um, uh, mitigate impacts on fundamental rights and freedoms. Uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, two points jump out at me from your presentation. You said 
uh, you asked the question, what is the legal framework to support privacy by design? And then you said that the conversation has been driven by a Western perspective, which is a very neat segue to our next speaker, who is Omar Sigrushni uh, from Morocco. Omar, you have 10 minutes, please. Many thanks, uh, Nigel. I want to share my screen to, to present some slides. Uh, where I can, uh, okay. you see my screen? Not for the moment, ah, now we're seeing it, yes, thank you. Okay, many thanks. I have uh, three ideas to share with you on this uh, problematic of identity and data protection. And my title is uh, An Identity Going Towards Social Digital Trace and Which Data Protection in This uh, Case. I will use uh, some definition already uh, shared by the past. What about uh, the legal, digital, and unique ID? An identity in my family is my first name because it helps me to make a difference between my sisters and brothers. In my district is my first name, my last name, and my address. In my school is all this plus my date of birth or place of birth. In my country is this with a national identity number. And perhaps in the world, it's all this with the nationality to have a, a reference of my passport. But in my identity, I can find the criminal report or also uh, the medical record. And the problematic for us today is that we, we computerize and I should, I choose computerization instead of digitalization to make a difference between translating a paper identity in an identity in the IT world. And for us, it is very different from what we are observing today that uh, our criminal report or, or is transforming as a life report with all the events or traces recorded on the digital world. So for us, it is there is a difference between the translation of the identity from paper to a piece on the IT world and difference between this and between the huge, uh, the huge uh, numbers of uh, of traces uh, which we can have or observe them in the digital world, and this huge amount of events create a new mode of governance. And the problematic is that the biometrics. It's the, the link between the identity in IT world here and all this. And this link will transform the way of identification. So we should have other, uh, other kind of data protection. What I want to say that in the past we had an identity through traditional social traces, witnesses or village inhabitants uh, could say that this uh, person is the son of this others and this person is the wife of this other. And after in a modern organization in the regalian state, we had identity by document, 
paper documents, and in the present, digital documents. But we observe that we are going to an identity not by documents, but by through social digital trace. Perhaps in an international platforms like a social networks or others, we could have in the future uh, identity by traces and only by traces. And perhaps in the future, we will not need to have documents to identify somebody. And in this case, the problematic is not this, is who will protect personal data. Because in the present, it is the data protection authorities related to the Regalian state, uh, which have the mission to protect the data. But if we go in the identity through social and digital traces, the question is who will, who will protect personal data? And another question is that we are observing that at this time, each service providers, each bank, each insurance, each service provider uh, uh, is building a biometric database, his, its biometric database. And the question is uh, who will provide in the future the identification, the authentication, and how we can organize the data protection in this uh, kind of uh, system and mechanism. Many thanks. Uh, thank you, Omar. Uh, we're going to uh, move now to the Philippines, from Morocco to the Philippines, and bring in yeah. Raymond uh, Enriquez Liboro. Uh, welcome, Raymond. You have 10 minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Nigel. And uh, let me just... Uh... Okay. Am I coming through uh, clearly to everyone? You are. We, your Thank your you. audio Thank is you. very Thank clear. You. We can see your screen. Uh, well, it's a, well, greetings from the Philippines, and uh, thank you for having. You know, when you're invited to talk about uh, digital identity e-commerce and e-governance from a regulator, uh, from a privacy regulator standpoint, you are basically going to talk about regulating privacy in the fourth industrial revolution. You see, the Philippines is an archipelago composed of 7,100 islands. It is nestled in the Southeast Asian region, surrounded by friendly neighbors, you have Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Brunei. This region is rising economically and transforming dramatically. And it's no surprise why this is so. Cross-border data flows have grown astronomically during the last decade. According to the report by global think tank McKinsey, Cross-border data flows have actually risen 45 times between 2005 and 2014. It's now 210 terabits per second. You talk about cross-border data flows, or that's about 1.2 billion selfies a minute. Increasing broadband connectivity, the lowering cost of data storage, has lowered cross-border transaction costs, translated to lower distribution and production costs thus reducing barriers to entry and has opened, to field, opened the field to small players who can now compete and become international businesses, marketing digital products and finished goods globally. So I am premising my talk today with what is happening in our region. 
For the Philippines, we are not only reforming, and it is transforming. We have a population of 124.2 million. Well, actually, those, those are Filipinos with mobile subscription, rather. We only have a population of 110. So obviously, many of our countrymen have uh, more than one mobile telephones, mobile, mobile phones, rather. 71% of the population, 76 million, are active internet users. 72 million Filipinos are mobile social media users. And we have, we have this infamous record of averaging the most number of hours or logging the most number of hours in the internet at 10 hours a day. But here are some more basic e-commerce statistics. Almost 10% now make their online purchases or pay their bills online. And these numbers are growing. It is estimated that uh, in 2020, almost 15% of all transactions in the country will be digital, or 20% will be digital. And this is a very uh, significant shift from the numbers since 2013. So the forecast for e-commerce in the Philippines, you will see here for internet retail, it's projected to grow to $12 billion by 2025. We have online travel, online media, ride hailing, and digital financial services. So with this, again, the Philippines is not only reforming, it is transforming. And it's transforming digitally. Yes, there is an ongoing revolution in my country, and it is of a digital kind. And it's anchored in a development plan that has been hatched some, um, you know, uh, that covered actually previous precedents. But the targets by 2022 is to lay down the foundation for inclusive growth a high-trust and resilient society, and a globally competitive, competitive knowledge economy. And with that, we have actually launched an e-commerce roadmap. The roadmap consists of establishing policies, raising awareness, conducting massive education and training, knowledge management, developing the infrastructure, the ICT infrastructure, coming up with processes, and most importantly, establishing a trust and integrity program anchored and enabling digital identities for all Filipinos. That's why we now have what we call the Philippine Identification System. It shall primarily be established to provide valid proof of identity for all citizens and resident aliens in the Philippines. It shall serve as the link in the promotion of seamless service delivery, enhancing administrative governance, reducing corruption, and strengthening financial inclusion, and promoting ease of doing business in my country. But you know, the journey towards this system has been long and arduous. In fact, it has spanned the last five decades. Some of our these former leaders are also familiar to you, but really. It's only now that finally a Philippine identification system has been enacted into a full law. And we have actually also rolled out a roadmap for this. And by 2022, the target is that 42 million Filipinos will be registered under the Philippine information or identification system. So having said that, I just would like to mention that uh, the Philippines legal framework or Philippine laws that are in place are the following. We have an e-commerce act that was enacted basically two decades ago, Cybercrime Prevention Act, and alongside that is the Data Privacy Act, which was enacted in 2012. Just would like to mention that our law, our enabling law, the Data Privacy Act, of 2012 is 
actually omnibus in nature. It applies to both the private and public sectors. It also has extraterritorial applications that can extend to every Filipino here and abroad. And second, our mandate as a National Privacy Commission is myriad. It, it, it encompasses a full range of powers and responsibilities. Well, basically, the logic remains simple. For personal data to be protected and privacy upheld, we strive to develop our own responsible digital citizens, accountable companies, and authorities that are enabled to protect data during its entire life cycle. Our law is heavily referenced to the EU Directive 95, the predecessor of the GDPR. The National Privacy Commission continues to advocate for the right of the people to data privacy. We are mindful of our role in the legislative process. We have made our presence felt during the deliberations of the Philippine Identification System. And we will, not, we will continue to do so and not renege on our role to provide guidance in crafting policy and be tireless in proposing measures to mitigate risks to rights and freedoms of individuals. At the end of the day, we must defer to the wisdom also of our legislators. Where a law or regulation poses privacy risk, the NPC remains to be tasked with the duty of recommending actions for personal data protection consistent with the provisions of our Data Privacy Act. Again, this pro those provisions indicate that part of our job is to build a consensus with other policymakers and to ensure that those who are committed to privacy rights have a seat at the table when national policy is discussed. So just to go straight now to uh, the national ID, which is being rolled out in my country, I would like to say that we tried our best to institute privacy by design um, in its inception. And uh, as you can see, with purpose specification, collection limitation, data minimization, use retention and disclosure limitation, security and accountability, under this privacy by design principles are the exact provisions or description of the provisions that were contained in that law, in the Philippine Identification System law. Openness, consent, anyone requesting entity or any requesting entity should obtain the consent of the registered person. In terms of compliance, no person may disclose, collect, record, convey, disseminate, publish, or use any information of registered persons, and give access or give copies, and it's very specific, including to law enforcement agency or units of the armed forces of the Philippines. So we tried our best to incorporate these privacy principles in the tax systems by default, into the Philippines Identification System Law and its IRR. So with that, I think what has made this possible after five decades, the clear public benefit and the privacy policy that is in place and the political will, not only of our legislators, but very important of the privacy body itself. Now, just to segue to the ASEAN, and this political will is now being shown in the region with one vision, one identity, and one community. It's now an ASEAN framework and digital data governance. An ASEAN Data Protection and Privacy Forum has been organized, and the Philippines has chaired the first ASEAN Data Protection and Privacy Forum. Out of the 10 member states, three member states have comprehensive laws in place, and two are coming up, Indonesia and Thailand. And finally, I think this parting shot for everybody. We at the NPC support the successful use of digital technologies and the processing of personal data in a manner that is effective and preserves and protects the data privacy rights of individuals. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to you, Raymond, for setting out uh, very clearly the, uh, the pace and the scale of the ongoing digital revolution in the Philippines. So from uh, Southeast Asia, we go to Argentina. Eduardo Bertoni, are you with us? I am, Nigel. Can you hear Thank me? You, and 
How are you? Okay. I'm, I'm, very I'm good. Thank going you. to I'm going to put a PowerPoint and, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I Excellent. will share, and you can tell me if everything is working okay, please. Whilst you put your um, PowerPoint on screen, let me just say to those who are following online, we've already got questions coming in. So please uh, add your comments, your questions for the experts using the Q&A tool within BlueJeans. Eduardo, you have 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. I'm trying to put... There is a slight delay. Can you see the PowerPoint? Can, yes, can you can. see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can. We're seeing your screen. Oh. You can move to your opening page. So, is the screen that says Agencia de Acceso a la Información Pública is what you are seeing? You don't want me to uh, say that in Spanish, but that's definitely what we can see. Thank you. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, well, thank you again for the invitation. I will I will try to speed up my my presentation. Um, coming from Latin America, we like we usually like to talk uh, like Garcia Marquez, but I, I a little bit longer. But I will try to 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 do it in in just ten minutes. Let me start uh, um, for some uh, general issues. Uh, the first one, the Access to Public Information Agency in Spanish, Agencia de Acceso a la Información Pública, uh, as probably many of the people in this room know, is the Data Protection Authority in Argentina since uh, 2017. Uh, actually, uh, before Argentina had a uh, Data Protection Authority, but uh, it was uh, an office that was within the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights. Today, the, the Data Protection Authority is an independent authority that it is in the framework of the, or administrative issue, in the framework of the Chief of the Cabinet of, 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 of Ministers. Uh, I was invited to talk about digital identity, but I want to start before going to my specific presentation to some general issues that I would like to, to put on the table. First of all, identification is uh, important first, but it's a need, and it is also a human right. So it is important, it's a human right to identify people. This is coming not from me now, it's coming from UNESCO, it's coming from the SDG 16.9, the, the, the development goals from the UN. Actually, the ICRC, the Red Cross, usually asks for identification of the people in refugee camps, uh, and uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, international statements that require and beg for identification of the people. And then comes technology, and technology can be very, very useful for identification of the people. But with technology comes some kind of problems. What kind of problems? One problem is what, uh, what, what has been called marginalization. Some people cannot use technology for identify themselves. So if we establish uh, programs that uh, only digital identity is possible, you are going to marginalize a, a huge amount of population around the world. And the other is the one that I want to expand today more, which is security problems. Security in terms of how we are using technology to uh, work on uh, digital identity cards. Um, at the end of the day, in my perspective, a, a lot of the security problems, or may, some of the security problems, are security problems that are uh, technological program uh, problems itself. But the other security problems are problems regarding to trust. In some situations, the problem is that people, in my view, do not trust in the government, so they don't want to give the information to databases that are in the government and that we will be handled in the government. So increasing the trust uh, on the security measures and increasing the trust of the government is coming hand to hand with the digital identification of the people. This is my view, and this is something that I am seeing in Latin um, America. In Latin America, yeah, sure. May I, I just, uh, just interrupt for one moment? Um, we've still got the last slide on our screen. Yes, uh, yes, and Raymond. it's okay. Ah, okay. So if we could just ask Raymond to stop sharing, 
Uh, hopefully now the people following can see your screen, Eduardo. But if there is any confusion around this, we will be uploading the presentations onto the Council of Europe site so you'll be able to see them. Sorry to interrupt, Eduardo. Please continue. Okay. Can you let me know when my, my PowerPoint is on the screen? Because... Uh, we're seeing at our end the final uh, slide from the previous speaker, Raymond. Uh, so what we can do is just ask you to continue and we will share your presentation with the followers uh, at a later point. That's okay with you. Uh, it but, is. But please continue. Please continue. Okay. Okay, so, well, uh, my last point was that the problem, uh, I mean, we have an, a necessity, identification of people, but we have some problems. Some of the problems created uh, with the use of technology, some of the problems created because of the lack of trust in the government when it's handled personal data. So, in my first uh, slide, I, I, I included uh, one of the problems or one of the, the situations that we had here in Argentina recently uh, in relation with the current uh, pandemic. Uh, the government established uh, in an official website the possibility to have some kind of a digital identification. Um, but uh, in May 2020, one month ago, approximately, we uh, received a complaint made by a citizen. He alleged that the application had certain uh, technical failures that could expose personal data stored in the ID section of the website, Mi Argentina. What happened? It, uh, uh, according to the, to, to the complaint, it was possible to consult personal data for other citizens of other citizens, uh, citizens without consent and there was no uh, validation method that would allow third parties to verify the authenticity of the ID when it was displayed. Um, the, 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 next, the, the next slide, I don't know where you are, <laughs> uh, is what we did. Uh, uh, we started an ex officio, an, an, not an ex officio, we started an, an, an investigation and we asked specifically to the government that uh, we need to detail the detail of uh, concrete security measures implemented to prevent disclosure of personal data from, from the app. Uh, and also we request if uh, the app is using an API for data exchange, and if so, specify the restriction mechanics, the mechanism, mechanism the, this, this API uses. Uh, and also, we suggested to suspend data processing until the appropriate security measures were taken. Um, as soon as the uh, um, people, the, the, the data processors, the government, I would say, uh, re receive our, our, our request, they first request an extension to, to, to answer. We granted that, that, uh, that, that extension. And uh, then they, they responded in, in a very complete way. Uh, they explained that the National Registry of Persons, which is the organism in charge of the data collect uh, by, the by, the, by the platform Mi Argentina, uh, that they have security measures that guarantee uh, double protection against any attempt to obtain data improperly. And they also explained to, to our agency that in 2019, in December, they began an audit process. And since then, procedures were or are underway for re-engineering process with aim of improving security measures and update the activity log of the app. Um, what was uh, our, uh, what was the, 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 the response? Um, one important thing is that we receive explanation that no data extraction or improper access was found. And we didn't find that after our investigation. And the particular service uh, that uh, created the problem uh, expired. Uh, and they were improvements uh, for the app. 
Uh, nevertheless, uh, when they, the, the, and this is important, when the government get notice, got notice about the failure, they turned down the survey, which was something that we requested. Remember that we requested to spend that that data process. So uh, in our decision, we 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 provided the uh, I mean the, the government um, provided um, as I was explaining uh, information regarding the APIs operation and implementation of security measures. They adopted the suggestion made by us uh, regarding the suspension of personal data processing. The security measures were taken. And currently, they are carrying out a engineering process with aim of improving measures and optimize the activity log of the application. Uh, we've uh, decided that uh, after our investigation there was not a violation of article 9 of our data protection law which is the the, the article that uh, obliged data processors to provide with security measures in in data processing but however um, uh, and however the we we reiterated our recommendation to implement a method of verifying the authentic uh, authenticity authenticity sorry, of the digital ID when being exhibited through the app. So why I wanted to explain this uh, uh, investigation that we did uh, here in Argentina, because the, the needs to have a di digital identity is something that is increasing, um, is something that uh, it is not only uh, taking place here in Latin America, in, in, in Argentina. Uh, we know that some of our colleagues uh, in the Ibero-American uh, uh, network of uh, data protection authorities are already concerned on digital identity issues. But uh, um, I, I, I will finish saying that the digital identity problems that I, I, I mentioned at the beginning, and there were in some way uh, uh, exhibited in the example that I gave to you, are problems that are more visible today because of the COVID-19, but there are all problems, uh, and or all problems because, as I said at the beginning, identification of people is not only important, is not only a need, but uh, some international bodies uh, consistently consider that identification of the people is a human right. So I will stop there. I think I'm not sure if I take more than 10 minutes, Nigel, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I will be more than open for use and A's. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. You came in perfectly on time there. Uh, thank you to all our speakers who've given us uh, viewpoints from around the world. And we're going to move now to the Q&A and, and bring in uh, Maria from Cyprus. Uh, Calispera, Maria. Maria, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Maria. Yes. Thank you, uh, thank you. Thank you for this, <laughs> um, I would like to thank all the speakers for these very interesting presentations. And um, uh, I would like to reflect a little bit on what was said and, uh, and the report was said by Pat. Um, um, balance, for sure, must be struck between uh, verifying a person's uh, a person identity uh, at a high level of assurance, at the same time, we should uh, safeguard uh, fundamental rights and freedoms. Um, um, but we see there are some risks and, uh, and um, question of transparency, interconnectivity between systems, and uh, use of biometric data. So my question is, um, what is uh, a digital identity when uh, an identity becomes uh, a digital life? Is this uh, technically achievable and needed? Maybe the speakers can reflect on that. Uh, Faristo, uh, Maria, um, before we go to the speakers to get their responses to uh, Maria's question, I've got a question that came in from uh, Dondi 
MAPA. I think this is quite an important one, which I think, given the international nat nature of our webinar today, I think uh, will be something that the, the panel may want to address. Uh, Dondi writes, natural calamities, for example, uh, the situation in Haiti, uh, which wipe out personal records in education, health, employment, can be mitigated by having a digital identity which can help victims of calamities in recovering from the disaster. Shouldn't this be a major consideration for countries with high calamity risk? So uh, to all members of the panel, can you um, perhaps respond to Maria and also to Dondi in your replies, please? Let me give, let me give the floor to Omar first, please. Thanks. For me, uh, I, I, I cannot hear very well, uh, Maria, but I, I guess the question, I think. Uh, for, for me, uh, globally, uh, it is uh, important to distinguish between uh, the useful identity and the protection of of the personal data. If our reasoning is uh, uh, about uh, the using of the identity to solve some biggest problem, the answer is uh, it is uh, obvious we should use these technical ways to uh, solve the humanitarian problematics, to solve the data governance of uh, social uh, programs uh, to solve all these these necessary uh, questions, but for me the problematic is when we are going to treat uh, data and all the the the, the things which uh, we uh, which uh, will help us to solve the problematic, we create. Uh, a question of data protection. So it is important to uh, have the, the, the right balance between the two questions. And for me, uh, act, uh, currently, we are going to uh, a traceability society, to uh, uh, an identity by, by a digital trace, and the question is that uh, the, the, the conception or the concept of identity uh, will be uh, transformed. And the question is where we will go and how we can ensure data protection in this new kind of framework. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Omar. Uh, Eduardo, you want to come in on that? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. You want to respond? Yes. Uh, I, I am trying to to respond to 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 the to the two things in 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 some way. Um, I remember that in our office we uh, received some time ago a consultation coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that wanted to enter into an agreement with the Red Cross particularly on the possibility to have identification cards or some sort of identifications in refugee camps and this, this, this kind of thing. And I, I, I would like to, to go back to, to the beginning of my presentation. Identification is a human right. Identification is a problem. Technology can uh, be uh, very useful for providing and for uh, yes and for 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 granting this this human right so we as data protection authorities or even in the global privacy assembly or in this uh, in, in 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 the convention uh, 108 uh, uh, members party i think that the, the is not to concentrate only in the input, only in the data gathering, but also in the output. I, and I explained. 
Of course, we have strong principles, proportionality. Okay, we are going to, we need data uh, in, uh, digital identity, but what kind of data are we going to collect? Is it is proportion or we are going to collect data that is not necessary for, for digital identity? So we can provide with example, with, with guidelines specifically on that side. And in the output, who is going to process this data? What are the security measures? For what purpose? And this kind of thing. So I think that we, as data protection authorities, as an experts on, on, on data protection, the best a way to grant it this human rights, which is identification, is to provide guidelines on the amount of data that is need to be collected for a digital identification card and the security measures uh, that are uh, going to put in, in practice. It's pretty obvious what I'm saying, but I think that it is best to do that, that to discuss the importance of digital identification. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. We're going to go to Pat, then we're going to go to Raymond. And for those who are following, we've got the Council of Europe Data Protection Commissioner online, uh, Jean-Philippe Valter. So I'm going to bring you in after our other two speakers, if that's OK. So, Pat, you wanted to make a point, please. Yeah, if I could just um, reflect on those two questions. So, Maria, you asked a question about your digital life. Um, I think when we think back to these 155 countries, that require you to have a proof of legal identity simply to obtain a mobile phone, uh, which is one of the biggest lies on the planet in, in my view. Um, then we have to consider that that, uh, you know, your mobile uh, device and its SIM card may have four unique digital identifiers that's tied to your national digital identifier. It may be that that is also tied to your social uh, media login. In some countries, you have to prove that in order to get access to Wi-Fi. So your whole digital life is quite exposed. We've had an app discussed today, a national identity app. And if I look at that app, it has Google AdMob, AdMob. So Google advertising embedded in this national identity app. It has Google Analytics embedded in it. It has Facebook login embedded in it. Now, these SDKs share data with these commercial entities. So actually, if I think back to the ADAR ruling, the judge said something really, really important, which was reiterated by the Supreme Court ruling in Jamaica. And I think all of us should reflect on these three key rulings, the Jamaica Supreme Court, the ADAR, and the Huduma number. And in ADA, it said there will be virtually no zone of activity left where the citizen is not under the gaze of the state. And when I look at the Philippines presentation, it's very clear that that, that is in fact uh, evident because our digital lives have become so central and refugees are increasingly, uh, you know, a, a mobile phone to them. And it's in the report that I wrote, they consider it a lifeline. And refugees increasingly are having to use mobile devices in order to establish an identity, in order to get access to basic services. And then uh, when I look at the Haiti uh, question, um, <clears throat> there you have cases, you have to think then, is that a case of a centralized identity database that failed because it wasn't resilient? Do you look at federated identity systems? But then let's, all, let's also look at something else in Haiti. When the earthquake happened in Haiti, one of the biggest problems for people was finding somewhere to charge their mobile phones because most buildings with electricity charging points had collapsed. So what they did was to rush solar powered charging and solar powered mobile phones to them. So there are some dependencies. When we talk about digital identity, we have to think about also the mediums by which we present that identity and that mediates our lives. Uh, thank you, Pat. Um, is Raymond still online? Perhaps you want to yeah, come back on some yeah. of the points that have been made? Yeah, yes, Nigel, uh, I'm still here. Uh, again, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, obviously, um, Mr. Mapa came from the Philippines, actually. And uh, the Philippines is, uh, <clears throat> when you talk about uh, uh, disasters and natural calamities, that uh, we're right at the uh, uh, ground zero of uh, of uh, hurricanes and earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. And uh, I just would like to mention that really uh, in uh, in our case, and I 
specifically been uh, carrying the cudgels for our region. Um, you know, uh, privacy in, in many instances really must be viewed in context. And, um, and as, as authorities and as privacy advocates, we have to act the role both as an enabler and protector uh, to be able to enable our citizens to gain from the digital experience and uh, to also benefit from the uh, uh, promises of digital. But at the same time, we have to be also um, resolute in our role as also as protector. That's why I mentioned that uh, privacy is also must also be considered in context, just like now, Nigel, in this time of a very unfamiliar pandemic, where you know uh, we are faced with new uh, debates about how to properly contact trace, how to treat, and how to test patients and use their personal data to be able to cope and basically combat this pandemic. This has really raised a lot of issues, but again, it has put again privacy in a, in a, again, in a very contextual situation. So uh, I, I guess, again, as privacy authorities, we really have to be right in the middle of weighing and uh, really weighing down on our role as both an enabler and a protector. But as I mentioned in my presentation, the most important part always is to have a seat at the table, to have a part in crafting uh, the you know, foundational laws, to be able to come up with the, uh, to be, to be, to ensure, you know, that uh, privacy has a place in all the discussion. We may not always win, uh, you know, uh, the battles, but in the end, again, uh, we remain steadfast and, uh, you know, play our roles efficiently and effectively, then we can, you know, uh, we, we could always be, um, the benefits that must accrue to our to our citizens, to our uh, our nations, can be met. So again, uh, just you know, that's a very contextual question. It really puts privacy again right in the middle of that uh, discourse. So you know, it, it really uh, illustrates now how contextual sometimes privacy can be. Indeed, thank you, Raymond. Uh, gentlemen, we're into the last two minutes of this webinar. Would it be okay if we just stay for a, just a few more minutes uh, longer so that we can get through some of the questions? I know that uh, Jean-Philippe Walter, who is the Council of Europe Data Protection uh, Commissioner, you have a question yeah. to put to members of the panel. Uh, bonjour, please uh, put your question. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I thank uh, the four speakers for their very interesting speeches. Uh, digital identity raises many data protection issues. One issue is a legal framework. I am sure you will agree with me that the use of digital identities carries with it many risks, in particular for the respect of human rights, including attacks on dignity and the risk of discrimination or of mass surveillance. Do you think that the inclusion in national constitution or in international instruments, such as the European Convention of Human Rights, of a right to digital integrity could strengthen the right of individuals to privacy? Uh, because we've got so many questions, can we can we uh, just can I just ask that Omar replies to your question, uh, Mr. Valter, and that way I can put the other questions that have come in from other other followers to our different experts. Would that be okay, Omar? Could you respond to the question from uh, Jean-Philippe uh, Valter, please? I uh, I agree with the, the answer that uh, Jean-Philippe wants to hear. It's a <laughs> what what, what uh, yeah, I want yeah. to say. <laughs> now, obviously, I, I agree that uh, the problematic of digital ID 
raise, raises a, a huge big risk. And my problem today is that we speak a lot about the advantage of the digital ID and we not speak sufficiently about the risk raised and the the the, the kind of uh, uh, measures we, we should uh, place to to master these risks and for me it is very very important to have an international an international framework as an instrument because a national framework for me are not sufficient today to uh, to 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 help to master the international risks because we are in a, a society where the traces will be will become uh, the fount of identity and it is not a regalian view or not a, a state view or country view uh, it is uh, a, a platform commercial platform international uh, way to identify uh, thank you omar i've got a couple of questions here for pat um one comes in from uh mks um are there any positive examples of national rulings on digital ids id numbers when it comes to ensuring the security of personal biometric data especially considering that the risk of data breach is going to grow as the databases expand and a second question from stefania who asks uh, pat i observed that many producers don't have any idea of privacy by design technology must introduce progress <coughs> and don't mind and 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 don't um, consider privacy what are you doing about it many corporations don't have a privacy team and they always think that this is an issue that this is issue uh, is not about legal compliance i think you understand uh, the the gist of the question how would you respond I do. please I'll, I'll take the second question first so um when i talked about capacity building um it's capacity building not just amongst policymakers um it's capacity building also amongst regulators but also capacity building amongst those who are designing uh identity solutions so with developers as well with developers helping them understand what data protection and privacy by design and by default mean for example uh when i look at the keneal recently he's produced a website and an audit methodology uh to help developers understand how to develop apps we need to do something similar I think on identity for those who are building the services too, but also work with policymakers and regulators on what digital identity means. Um, as I said, I looked at a national digital identity um, app a moment ago, and I'm shocked by some of the embedded trackers, the party trackers that I see in it. On the uh, other question, uh, just remind me again, Nigel, the first one again. Um about uh, positive examples of national rulings on digital ID okay. numbers. Yeah. So the only positive, the only positive rulings I've found are those that, uh, like Jamaica, that struck down <laughs> the biometric digital identity system because it was disproportionate, it was unjustified, and it was an overreach of the state. So for me, that's a positive ruling. Uh, if I look at Hudu Manamba and some of the rulings that the court made there, uh, requiring changes to be made, there are many positive things in that ruling. It's not over yet, I, I, I would say. Uh, and then in Ada, we've seen uh, changes in that court ruling. Um, for me, the only thing that's positive is the increasing scrutiny of the courts on this matter. And I think it requires more scrutiny of the courts because biometrics, if we look at some of the databases that have been compromised, if I look at some of the fraudsters already operating in this place, that are dressing up as, as employees of telecom operators, 
to go and take the biometrics of people pretending to be from the telecom operator in order that they, get, they can get the biometrics to scam people because biometrics are used in the mobile identity space. I think we do have problems and I, and I think we need the courts and particularly uh, we need regulators to have the resources because regulators may have the will but they don't always have the resources and we need regulators to be appropriately resourced and skilled to be able to take uh, to be able to have effective oversight in this space and to take enforcement where enforcement is warranted. Thank you, Pat. Let's move to our last two questions now. Uh, is Raymond from the Philippines? Are you still online? Yes, of course, uh, Nigel. Yeah, I'm still Excellent. here. Thank I've got you. a question from uh, Andreas, I think. Uh, will humanity reach a point where ID no longer relies upon the traditional ID data, such as names and photos, uh, which which uh, is currently the basis for ID. Do you see it changing to identifiers comprising biometric data such as ooh, dactyloscopic data coupled with digital traces and or life logs? <laughs> well, Nigel, I don't have a crystal ball on that. Uh, but then again, as a privacy regulator, uh, like we, what we always say, we are not the gatekeepers of what can or cannot be done. We do not dislike or like technologies. We are technology, should be technology neutral. And uh, actually, while I was researching about biometrics, uh, Pat, and I was trying to, as part of the GPA, I was really looking back at how far the ICDPPC, which is the predecessor of the GPA, have gone on uh, coming up with resolutions on biometrics. And I re realized and discovered that there was a resolution in 2005 and neither did they condemn or indict uh, biometrics during that time, which is actually touted as the most invasive privacy technology that has ever been invented. And now we are faced with emerging and nascent technologies that uh, again are being uh, uh, you know, uh, faced with the same indictment. So I guess, uh, again, uh, going back uh, to the role of privacy authorities uh, during this time, and uh, and it's very uh, important that we learn to wear the different hats during this, uh, again, during this very difficult time. We're at the crossroad, the conjuncture of technology. So many new and emerging technologies are, uh, again, uh, coming up. And uh, what we're here for, and what we should be really mastering, again, is how to stay, again, how to help uh, everyone uh, decipher and analyze uh, the risks to be able uh, to inform them of uh, attendant risks. And, uh, uh, and, and that actually uh, 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 covers uh, from governments to citizens. And, and uh, uh, it's very important that uh, privacy authorities remain their, uh, retain their credibility uh, during this period and uh, 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 remain to be trusted by, by the citizens. So really it's a, it's a most difficult time to be a regulator during this time, uh, Nigel, uh, when uh, so many things are really transforming and uh, historic history, uh, well, is really in a conjuncture. Thank you. I feel your pain, Raymond. Uh, <laughs> for, our final, for our final question, let me go to Eduardo. I hope you have your crystal ball because this is uh, less a question and more a comment. Uh, it's from somebody who doesn't leave their name. The person says, in the future, our digital identities will be used to track the ways we are addressing climate change. How much energy are you consuming? How much water are you using? What is your carbon footprint? Are we willing to be tracked that way? Is the trade-off to save the earth worth the loss of privacy? What are your thoughts on that point, Eduardo, to close our webinar this afternoon? Well, I don't have the crystal ball, but uh, for sure, uh, I, I, I return to one of my points. It, it's, it is something related to trust. I'm not sure. I mean, it depends on how we design our digital identity technologies, if they were if they will be uh, useful for tracking people or not? Uh, probably yes, uh, and and we need to 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 include, I mean, or or to recall uh, basic principles uh, that will not allow to do that, even though we have a digital identification. 
So my point is, uh, I really don't know. Uh, probably if we are doing uh, digital identification uh, with a technological design that is not following the privacy by design principles or the privacy by default, or even we are not uh, you know, encouraging uh, the government to do a PIA, privacy impact assessment, before putting digital identifications uh, in, in, in place, uh, probably we will have problems. Uh, but uh, I, I, I want, to, I want to, to, uh, to agree with my colleague from, from the Philippines. I mean, we are the DPAs, we are in a difficult time. Some people uh, trust in us. Uh, some people think that we can do more than we can do. Uh, and some people uh, think that uh, we have the crystal ball and we don't have the crystal ball. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, we're joined now by Sophie. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. Good morning and uh, good evening to everyone. I wanted just to come on the camera to say a big thank you to, to our speakers. I've had, uh, I've had messages about this all men panel. And this is only to balance the all women panel we had just before. So it was a pleasure to see you all four on the screen. Thank you very much. And with that, we bring this webinar to a close. Thank you to our excellent speakers throughout the day. Thank you to those of you who've sent in comments and questions. And of course, thank you to all of you who've been following this webinar today and in previous in, in, and yesterday. Join us again tomorrow for two more webinars. Thank you and goodbye.